My name is Vic Liu. I'm the director of the San Francisco INSEAD Hub for Business Innovation. I'm a serial entrepreneur and also lecturer at Stanford and Presidio Graduate School of Sustainability. Uh, the hub is not only a, a San Francisco hub, but it's also a hub for XR Immersive initi Initiative with 50 headsets ready to go. Today's webinar is part of the series Tech Talk X by Digital INSEAD, and we are streaming live from Abu Dhabi, the very first annual meeting of the global XR management community. Tech Talks are dedicated to exploring new techno technical uh, uh, technologies, digital technologies, and their applications, as well as the impacts they have on management, business, and society. Tech talks are both technical and business talks presented by leading technologists, thought leaders, industry practitioners, innovators, entrepreneurs, and academics. Please go to digital at INSEAD for more information. And this talk is brought to you by Accenture. For those who are joining us from the web, uh, on the slide here are a couple of things you want to keep in mind. The audience is muted and with the video off and the chat disabled. Please use the Q&A box to suggest questions for the speakers or our panel. You can also upvote the questions so you can help us find the most relevant questions for today's talk. Your questions, we hope, will be short and concise and the webinar is being recorded as we speak. And if you have any technical difficulties, please email us at digital at The objective of this panel is to explore how might we enhance the effectiveness of business education with XR technology. Why don't we start by giving ourselves uh, a quick introduction. Why don't we start with Peter? Okay, so Peter Zemsky, Deputy Dean, Dean of Innovation and a Strategy Professor at INSEAD. So maybe I'll just say a few words about INSEAD. I guess most of this audience would know us and briefly what we're doing on, on, on VR before we kick off. So I'm um, obviously, for those who don't know, NCAT, really big MBA program, but lots of local executive development. So a pretty um, impatient audience and, and one that it's super important to engage. And I think in terms of VR, we started back 2018, 2019 with one passionate, engaged faculty member getting us to experiment um, and then um, we're at the point now where we've actually scaled up. So we started seeing that there was a fit between the technology and, and not all the stuff that we teach, but enough of it that we could really see, wow, some of the, there's a whole set of paper cases um, that students are maybe tired of reading that could and maybe should be disrupted. And instead of imagining that you're the protagonist, you can put on these goggles and, and be the protagonist. So we're at the point where we've, we've built about 20, 20 of these experiences, different ones, some with actors, some on, on location, some that have, you know, we've learned a lot in, in that journey. Um, and we've also, I think that, you know, the one of the challenges in VR is the hardware and how you actually get um, robust delivery. So we've started down that journey. Um, also, how do you get faculty engaged and on it? Not just the ones who write the cases, but, but those who are just busy and, and looking for a good class. So we, we have gotten about 40, um, faculty on it and about 5,000 students. So we're really at that, that time where we're seeing it can scale. Um, and again, one of the reasons we have people here with us at our campus in Abu Dhabi is, you know, we're not going to disrupt alone. So we're also very much looking to connect with others um, who are also experimenting in the space and learn from each other. So I'm Yoran Hashai. I'm the Dean of the Arizona School of Business at Reichman University. Reichman University is the only private university in Israel. As such, we, are, we take pride at, uh, you know, providing a very different educational experience to our students. And hence, it was very natural once uh, we got to think of uh, VR, the, to think how we create VR content and implement it in class. So we started back in 2018 together with Ithai Stern and INSEAD, some of the things we do on our own, not only in the business school, also in the law and psychology schools. Uh, some we do in collaboration with INSEAD, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about it later. Uh, I think the tipping point was um, COVID, where we uh, understood that we need to provide a different learning experience to students that are at home. I can tell more about it, but this really pushed us towards uh, doing more and more uh, content and classes uh, uh, based on VR. Uh, I think up till now, 
few thousand students have gone through the experiences. We've gone through them uh, three years, yeah. Um, and it's much fun. Stephen? Yeah. So I'm Stephen King, and I'm a professor of emerging technologies and innovation at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I run Blue Sky Innovations, which is a joint lab between the business school, the Husband School of Journalism and Media, and a lot of computer science concepts. And we bring all of these teams together to solve problems, and we leverage storytelling and technology to engage students and learners. Um, so we do a lot of work around virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, blockchain, robotics. Our lab is doing a lot of different experiments um, and how we uh, apply technologies for business as well as education. Well, let's talk about your current experiences. We'll start off with Stephen. Uh, we were doing mashing last night in a safari dinner. And uh, in the car, we were talking about how you have a slide that showed uh, the telephone from 1950, its features compared to today's phone which is much smaller and a lot more features. And you showed two identical classrooms <laughs> because it's from the 1950s. There's not a whole lot of change that happened since. So, so what, wh why does the business school need to rethink how we teach? Well, I think higher education is waiting to be disrupted if it's not being disrupted already. I think we're in a place where um, the expectation of students is changing the expectations of the companies that they're going to be working at is changing. And we must train and teach our students to learn in new and unique ways. We must be able to leverage that technology for the education. And then we also need to be able to teach students how to leverage that technology to solve those problems. So if we think about 50 years ago, students were in a nice line of desks and you say, oh, well, we've added projection technology. Well, guess what? They had it back then too. So that hasn't changed that much. So how are we making this experience better? Our phones have changed, our cars have changed, everything else has grown in technology. So should our learning. And so what we're doing with VR is a way of giving people the access to be able to go to a different time and place to be able to simulate experiences, to be able to try things out. And I think that gives a whole new learning experience for our students who are you know, paying a significant amount of money, who are getting learning from top professors, but they need to get it in a way that helps them to learn and not just learn in their head, but kind of make a behavioral change. I see. So look, if, if I'm thinking more specifically about business school, like uh, business school is unknown, not teaching in the traditional methods, but we, business school have the case study method. Well, the Harvard style, business, Harvard business school style, the case study method is 60 years old. So. Uh, uh, I think that the Z generation and naturally the following ones do not have patience of reading a text of 30 pages before class. And we are feeling it more and more and you know, you can force them and do cold calls and everything. We know all the systems, but uh, once you replace that with this part of it with VR cases where we don't need to pre prepare a lot, they can uh, experience a very immersive experience being in specific uh, situation, uh, understanding the protagonist, sometimes being the protagonist. This is something that uh, is very powerful, very effective as, as a learning experience. And uh, I'm sure we are heading there. This is why we're investing all these resources in going there. Uh, it will take time like any other technology, but uh, it's clear to me that we need to offer something different for future business school. Just to pick up on some of that, one of the things I find amazing when we saw some of the experiences were in groups, students would go back into the VR experience. Because in principle, if you do it right, the VR can be incredibly rich. It can cap if you're in an African, actual African clinic, like you said, that you, you, you can just see how are the parents reacting, the doctors, the nurses, and again, you have to discover how to build those experiences. So that's that's one. But the other one um, also, I mean, again, it does respond, I guess, to uh, the current generation and the impatience with, with reading. But also, I mean, you could say you could do that with video. But one of the things, when I was thinking about whether to sort of sponsor this as a dean of innovation, I think one of the most, the sort of aha moments for me was you know that effective learning needs to be active. And the problem with, say, video is it's actually quite passive, right? The, the director is telling you where to look. Whereas here, you know, you're in the middle of the boardroom, drama's happening, and you have to decide who to look at. And, and that, that was one. And then once you start to, to see that, then you think, wow, and then this is digital. So then you can start to play around and say, wow, as instructor, what happens if you knew on average where your class was looking? And, and so you start 
to discover a whole set of new things you can do with the technology. So there's uh, a, a lot of data collecting that can be done that can be effective in helping us pretty much design the next generation. It's a really, I mean, it's, a, anyway, it's a, this two-sided market. Yes, we have to engage the students, but somehow we have to engage our colleagues as faculty and they can see, make them, you know, more, two, effective. <laughs> make them more effective and, and not too onerous, right? So that's, that's, that's there, there are challenges with VR, we'd have to admit. Yeah, this is a takeaway from earlier's uh, recap, uh, but learning by being seems to be a, a nice uh, recap of what we're talking about here. So this VR experience and this immersive platform, um, it's rather costly. So can, can you tell us what are uh, some of your experiences and uh, what are metrics of success that your deans or funders or other people are looking for? continue this. Yeah, I had this conversation with my dean <laughs> two days ago. Um, I think, yes, it is an expensive endeavor and uh, it costs money to build this type of content and want to make sure we're getting the most value of that. So how many students are engaging there and then are they learning in ways that are better, deeper ways than what they're doing in the traditional classroom? So we want to make sure that we're, we're seeing those types of changes and measuring those types of things. Um, I also think there's this this place for us to be a leader in this and for other companies to see what we're doing and us to be able to engage in consulting executive development types of pieces for this. And so that's another value that we use on the on the VR side of things. But ultimately, we just want to make sure that we're building better leaders. And yes, we have to have metrics behind that. We need to know if we're doing that or not. But that's the goal of what we're doing in VR is to help create better leaders and decision makers. Well, that leads to my next question, which is maybe a but going around, what is the greatest achievement you're most proud of with the initiatives that you've started? So other than actually, uh, you know, creating content, which I think is something that it's a process, it takes a few months to create a good VR case. Uh, the thing that I remember the most is that, uh, you know, during COVID, we were all, uh, you know, kind of feeling uncomfortable with the Zoom experience and even worse, the hybrid experience. and. Uh, so uh, I remember this, it was very powerful that in one of my classes, I uh, delivered a case where I had uh, 25 students sitting in class. This was, you know, this is the amount of students that we were allowed to bring into class. Even it was a large class. Uh, and then 25 students who got masks via masks to their home. And it was a very successful hybrid class because the hybrid experience for the students that did not just participate from distance, but actually were uh, seeing the same case. And you always let them have some bit when you ask the question to let them answer first. But otherwise, they had a really, really rich experience. This was very powerful, and students were very happy. So we think this is something that uh, we are kind of happy with. Maybe on the two comments, on, on the financial side, I mean, it is as much as we say, oh, let's disrupt the paper case. It's also a little bit like a sim, right? So the actual cost is maybe an order of magnitude more than writing a paper case. So I, I do think it's a it's a bit of an ecosystem play. It'll be important that we have the scale. I don't think any one school is going to build all of their VR experiences. It's, it's going to be a, more of a, an industry play, and I think that'll that'll help us. Um, then I well, lots of lots of um, uh, anecdotes. Well, actually, one just last week, and this is on the faculty side, but we done this mission to Mars simulation where um, students are all getting different information. Because one of the nice things about the headset, everyone's got their private little space. And so you can create this thing in management education where team members have different information. And you see how much they pull it together. Anyway, we, we've been perfecting this, as one of you said. You, you keep working on it. We had this faculty team that had perfected this thing. So finally, when you saw people make all kinds of different decisions at the end of, of the mission, but on average, it was kind of, there was a wisdom of the crowd. And, and again, what, what was striking to me was that the faculty were willing to engage for a year, tweaking and improving their thing till they got it, oh, it's just, just right from a pedagogical point of view. And again, there, there are many different metrics, but to see some of your top faculty just believing in it and, and investing their passion and their intellect in it was, was nice to see. I would say one of the things in our lab is we're trying to invent the future of storytelling and uh, we've been working on doing affordable volumetric capture. So the idea that any of your campuses would be able to have a way of taking a 3D capture of a person, a professor, a whoever, a business leader, and teleport them into the metaverse, into your 3D classroom uh, to be able to let them present and engage with students. 
Um, and so right now, the way that the big Hollywood studios are doing it, it costs $20 million to build those studios. And so it's cost prohibitive. Uh, and we're trying to get that down to a $10,000 piece of equipment, uh, leveraging AI um, and computer vision. And we hope to launch that this fall. So that's a pretty exciting place to be. And so I'm pretty proud of our team for that. Yeah. So I want to add that uh, I think at our university, we were very fortunate that uh, the top management really understood the importance of that, and they were kind of generous in providing the funds that we needed out of pocket. Actually, you know, of, clearly, it, you know, it's it's a losing operation right now. I think everybody admits that. But another important challenge uh, is to have enough champions among your faculty. You cannot do it without it. And uh, I'm happy that you know I was the first in the business school that started with that. Then became coming in, so of course I'm pushing it. But I. I'm starting to see other faculty members really engaging it, maybe more than I am. A bit busy now, but, and, and that's really that's really a good sign because uh, it cannot be just you know a one-man show. You have to have the champions, like Peter said, that they believe in it and they invest their precious time in developing cases like that. And then the other side is um, like the back office, right? So again. The, the challenge of the technology, as you know, is the hardware, right? And, and it's getting 50 headsets all working in class with the, with the right segment on, but also storing the hardware and stuff. So even um, to, to see the rest of the organization step up, and we have this great thing, they went out to Ikea and they designed a whole, which I think you now have in the, uh, in the hub, but you know, how do you design the perfect shelving unit to store, get them in, get them out. Uh, but yeah, just working out those details is, is fun to see people work on. While we're here, I want to see which, which system did you get? <laughs> I'll, I'll, use it in our lab. I'll send you the link. <laughs> so, I mean, for the audience, what is one thing that you would um, maybe recommend in terms of rolling out? What are, who are the stakeholders who are helping? Who are stakeholders who are hindering this process? Yeah. Well, I think one of the most important ones that I um, built a relationship with is our chief information officer for the business school. Um, she understands what we're doing and it took time for us to get and we built this relationship over time. But ultimately with her support, it makes us more effective. It makes it easier to support the students and engage. So I think you know having that technical leadership that's already in the school and they have their responsibilities and be able to bring them on board and make them a part of the solution is really important. So we, we have quite a strong uh, communication school with uh, folks that uh, research VR and also know how to, some of them know how to create content. So this was the start. This was extremely important, you know, to kick off. Uh, later on, uh, people like Daniel Lando and Alon Epstein from uh, AVR were immensely helpful in helping us develop the cases. So you need a combination of this technological slash the global side that will support you. Uh, and of course, you know, all the, it's small things, but the technical stuff, that the mask will be there working, <coughs> the right class, everything works, and there will be some technical assistance. If it's, it's enough that, uh, you know, one student has problems and it, you know, I always kind of think of, uh, okay, I, I have this in my mind, the difference between the European sports and American sports. So European sports, sports, uh, football, as we call it, sorry, flow, and American sports, uh, sport, they have these stops. Even if the basketball is very different when it's European and American. So to me, to some extent, uh, VR is still uh, an American sport. Like, there are stops, <laughs> too many stops. And the more, oh, we, like, yeah. the more we increase the flow, we will be in better position. Yeah. So frictionless. Yeah. Exactly. So definitely, I mean, it's not, you definitely need frontline faculty who are getting excited, but it's not enough because the school has to support this one. And especially if you're going to take on and own and operate a fleet of headsets, you need someone in IT and, and maybe someone in the leadership team above that to say, yeah, this is going to be important. Let's go down that. Um, the other thing I think that's important for a lot of you know, faculties is that, yeah, you, it's great now you can get started with other schools' content and definitely ad advise that. And then once people see what's possible today, then you can start to build your own stuff. I think one nice thing about this industry, it's a little bit like a film industry, you can go and find people who know how to film, people who know how to write scripts. I mean, if you're motivated, um, you can put together these kind of teams and, and have a lot of fun with it. But figure out what it's about before you dive in. <laughs> yeah. 
because yeah. this is to create the content is very expensive. The production cost is expensive. So you need to know what are the learning objectives? What are you really trying to teach? How are you going to teach that? And then you start to produce it. So yeah, don't yeah yeah. We, we we I think we probably all went a lot of learning the hard way. Exactly. So, yeah. So many years of that. Don't reinvent all that wheel. So this ecosystem that we're talking about. <clears throat> excuse me. What are some of the uh, aspects of it that are really important to look at before diving in? Is it to like you said the content? Is it, uh... The first question would always be, of course, why VR, right? So if it's just you know interviews with individuals, I mean, it's kind of nice. It's a little more engaging. But, you know, your people are likely, you don't want someone in class, at the end of class, say, but why did we have to put the headsets on? What? So, so really having, so your faculty are going to have great ideas, but someone who can be there to say, first of all, why VR? But then also to understand all the interesting things you can do with VR, like the heat maps of where people look, or giving different people different information so that they can um, actually create something that uses the potential of the technology. So two things that I have in mind. One is that uh, because we need to create some critical mass of different VR pieces, like uh, I think conferences like the one that we are having uh, here is extremely important because you know I learned so much about content that I didn't even imagine that exists. And uh, if we create uh, ways that are uh, commercially viable, uh, and I think that's uh, possible, uh, it will be for the best of everyone because we can share, we can have a much more variety of cases to, to use. And, and I think this is extremely important for the ecosystem to develop. Secondly, I think one important thing that uh, I saw many VR cases uh, help uh, our the education process is that you, you can take the same case. Uh, it was also discussed to, uh, here today. And uh, the same thing and discuss it from the OB perspective, strategy perspective, marketing perspective, we have done that. Now, why is this important? First, it's cost effective. Second, I truly believe that our students, especially the undergrads, they find it hard to understand how the different disciplines that we are teaching them come together. And suddenly you can exemplify that in a very natural way. Take that, and you're building around one company with one series of characters. The storytelling grows so quickly, and so you already have an understanding of that character from the previous time. Exactly. But we can do. We don't have to spend time develop doing character development. We can jump right into that next meeting that happened, and wow, why are they reacting that way? Because we've built this character in this company over time. Yeah. Or like we did the CGI stuff on Mission to Mars. And like, look at. Okay, guys, you're going to build at least three more experiences with Based on that price. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, gain the scale. Also, I also say from an INSEAD point of view, we've been surprised how things that maybe we built for the MBA have definitely stretched up and done executive, or then other partners have even used them for undergrad. So, again, there, there is. Um, with that that base material, you can actually right. we do a lot. We always have our target audience in mind, but we can kind of go back and forth. But I'll give you one example of one that we totally changed in version two. Um, was we built this project in Cameroon where you went to Cameroon to decide if you should market a product there and learn cultural communications and kind of a lot of different things there. But in it, it had a kind of a gamification where you had to set the price and what was your marketing strategy and all this. And essentially, the MBA is all they want to do is win. Yes, they just wanted us to have the highest price in the end. And so ultimately, after our user testing, we realized, let's take that out. That wasn't the learning objective. We didn't care about pricing. Right? Right. It was all really about having the cultural context of it. So we took those pieces out in version two. And now that actually is used across the board from undergrads all the way up to executives. So what you're saying is collectively a kind of like net Netflix series. So you want to get addicted to it so that you know the characters. Absolutely. And it yeah. reloads the next episode yeah. right yeah. for you. Mission so, to Mars 3 coming yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah. So people will be anticipating maybe. Maybe, yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk, talk a little bit about the future of uh, XR. Well, anyway, so, um, well, I guess we're broadcasting today when I think uh, Apple's going to be announcing their possible new AR VR headset. And I would say maybe that's not so important. So one of the things you see is there's a fair amount of hype up or down, obviously, Facebook and Metaverse and then not. Um, but, you know, I, uh, for me, at the end of the day, it's not about the over. I mean, sure, it helps when there's a lot of buzz around the technology. But at the end of the day, you're asking yourself, does it create value in our use case? And I think we've all seen that it does. And it's just what, what for me, a lot of the future, again, we should certainly talk about new things that are coming, 
but just based on what we have today, existing headsets, existing cameras, I still think there's a lot to be discovered about how to use it effectively for storytelling and education and integrating curriculum, all the things you talked about. So, so for me, there's just a lot about getting the juice even out of the existing curriculum technology. So I think we still have some way to go. Uh, you know, uh, you look at the masks that we are using today, they are cumbersome. I think people where prices are lower and masks are more elegant, we will see more and more students using them. Actually, I, I, I foresee a situation in our university that we need every student, uh, you know, as part of the tuition, uh, a VR mask. This is something that will serve you, like you give them laptops, yeah? Uh, and so, so the cost of hardware is, is one thing. And the other thing I believe that needs to be improved is, as I said earlier on, going towards European sports, improving the flow. So some things that, for instance, uh, Daniel and his uh, colleagues at AVR are developing, like control panels, this helps a lot. You don't need to wait for every student to push the button like we did today, and you know, one has to scratch his hair or something, yeah? <laughs> Everybody sits together. Everybody finish more or less together, and so, so, so th we are going there. The fact that we are seeing lots of starts in many different uh, places, you know, we. we Many of us teach strategy. We know how technology is emerged. This is, you know, we are seeing an emerging technology. There have been picks and throws. We know we are, you know, but it seems like we, you know, we cannot predict when, but it's going there. Clearly, we are at the beginning of the growth stage, I believe. I'll go a little bit farther out and talk about the 3D classroom, this idea of a virtual world where people come together in 3D space. So we, you know, we have the Zoom, we have the flat version of this, and you're on the webinar and you're seeing this. But imagine if we were all engaging anywhere in the world, but coming into a 3D space. We can collaborate together, we can work in small teams, we can move around. And I think that is where we're going to see significant growth in XR. And that's why a a successful consumer device really helps us because now we don't have to have a set of 40 in the classroom. We can actually, everyone can have one as they go out. And so, yes, I, w I hope that the Apple device is successful. I think at the price point, it's not going to be, um, but they're going to learn a lot from it. And what they learn from that, I think the price will come down and we'll see other players in the market. Thank you. you know, definitely, I think from a school strategy point of view, you're investing in something that works today and positions you as the sector develops, right? And clearly cheaper will be better um, uh, and all of that. But um, still, I would, I would still come back and say, um, we're, it's not clear how fast that some of those problems are gonna get solved, unfortunately. Using your analogy of football versus American football, uh, having the, as the same platform to be able to develop in the back end would be really useful. Uh, do you see emerging technology that well, I heard earlier that Apple may be different than the rest. Um, what are some thoughts? Maybe I'll, on I'll answer consumer and then you can talk about kind of the academic side of that. So, yes, I think a platform for delivering content that works like the App Store, right? The App Store is so easy. Everyone publishes to it. It's safe and it's secure. And there's kind of all these great things that have made Apple successful. They can give their hardware at a lower price because they're going to make the money on the back end. There's all these great reasons platforms matter. And so I think, yes, on the consumer level, having a great platform that you can distribute content easily is really valuable to us. But also, as business schools, there's other platforms. So, yeah, well, so we clearly, as an industry, would do well to build more of a B2B platform where faculty can go, test out experiences, but then also where the IT department can quickly get it and put it on the, the, the so that has to be built. Um, actually, one of the super interesting things from a strategy point of view is how open are the different headsets? Because again, our vertical is different and it, it's great if people are writing for consumer, but they're not thinking about what's it going to take to run 50 headsets simultaneously in a classroom and actually building for that. Now, if they're open enough, um, then you can go in and, and, and put those controls on. If they're not, I won't name any particular companies, but we probably know what I'm thinking about. Um, it, it, it can be a real headache. I mean, I'll say right now, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll say right now, the most important thing I'm thinking about for that announcement in a few hours is not what does the device look like. It's, is Apple going to adopt uh, OpenXR? That's the biggest, most important thing to me right now. So I'll probably not watch that space. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, but I, I agree with Peter that we have to think of a kind of a business school or academic uh, platform. Something like HBS has for cases. Uh, and I think it was said here today that uh, 
we as academics can deliver very, very different content than what the consultants and others can because we can bring in the research, the theoretical depth into our cases and it has been done, I've, I've seen it done, in many of the cases that exist here uh, that we'll discuss today. And uh, one such platform will emerge and it will be easier you know, to download from it uh, through subscription or any other model. It, it, it will begin to kick off, that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Now, yeah, there is a question of the hardware, but we have enough, you know, even without Apple, we have so many Absolutely. Uh, oh, good enough now. Apps that are good enough, oh, high yeah. quality, last for long, by the way, we have our ones that are more than three years and they are great. And, you know, in the beginning, we thought we would need to exchange them. I and mean, it's best that's the investment every several years up to now. I think one thing, again, since sitting at INSEAD with where we touch a fair amount of corporate ed, but it's a huge pool. So, again, the other side, if you think about the Harvard Business School publishing piece, they started in academia, but a huge chunk of their revenue is into corporate. And, and obviously, given all the change today, there's huge demand for reskilling and upskilling in corporate. So, if we could sort of establish this within the academia, but then also reach out to that segment. Because again, it's a costly technology, and the bigger the market we serve, the more fun we can have. So. More cases. Um, I know that we, last night we talked a little bit about what you did with a certain client. Uh, how are you engaging with your clients to help educate that there is such a thing called immersive uh, learning experiences? Working with different companies, it's exciting to see what their problems are. So as we go and, and meet with them, it's it's kind of a consulting role of just, you know, what is the issue, understand the underlying issue, and sometimes VR, AR, whatever is the solution to solve that. Um, you know, we're working with one of the major hospitality uh, hotel companies, and they're trying to bring general managers up to what it's like to be a general manager in a luxury brand. And that is a really very difficult jump from kind of the major level to the uh, major leagues there. Um, and so VR gives us a chance to let them see that first person to do that in a way that feels real, that kind of, you know, all of a sudden I'm able to experience the real life of someone who's in those, like kind of in those shoes type of role. And that's been really exciting to see um, because we've actually seen people say, that's not the job for me. And they walk away because they're like, I don't really want to do that. Valuable lesson right there. Think about how much money that company just saved by not putting that person through training and then them washing out six months later, right? And so there is value for corporations. Well, there are a couple of growth areas I see. One is what you're saying, digital for physical, right? But clearly, as the online world in some ways gets more problematic for humans, I, you know, the, the, you see the desire for luxury, but for experiences in general, it's going to go up. And so I think the ability to train people on creating experiences is great, huge fit with VR. Um, another one we're exploring is, is also sustainability, right? So also just, again, taking people, whether it is like experiencing an actual sustainable kitchen or whatever, or just getting out in the world, seeing some of the damage and bringing those emotions back um, could be quite powerful. Um, first demand comes from the industry, like we see it. Like the word of mouth works and they come and, come and demand. Given an interesting example, to my mind, not from the business school, but we are uh, planning to open a medicine, a medical school uh, in 2024. Now, one of the problems, uh, it's, we, it's a huge problem in Israel, uh, because you don't have uh, enough time for students to go to hospitals and you know, participate in surgery, etc. VR can replace that, and actually, a vast budget of this uh, med medicine school is aimed to the development of uh, VR. Uh, experiences that will replace, you know, visits in hospital. So, you know, this is a big thing. It's, it's something that will, uh, you know, really solve bottlenecks that currently exist. And uh, we are very happy that uh, we can use technology for that. You really feel the demand coming from the market. I mean, VR is great at building empathy, let you see what it's like to be somebody else. And so from a medical perspective, you know, giving nurses and doctors the chance to see what it's like to be a patient. We built a one for a trauma patient coming in on the helicopter kind of all the way through the trauma scene. Um, and I, you know, kind of lay out on the floor, head straight up and realize, yeah. wow, I don't know anything going on. And that was really what we wanted those nurses to understand. And so, um, so there's really great value in, in VR for empathy and teaching. So we had this experience where in our, our core strategy class, we, we brought in companies, we wrote special cases, we had like 500 MBAs advising them. And then somebody was like, you know, why are 500 MBAs advising for free, you know, an Irish 
aircraft leasing company. Like, well, okay, that's a good point. So then we are, why don't we go find some really cool NGOs that are trying to grow globally? Sounded good, but then you realize like, wow, how many of our MBAs have ever been in like an African clinic and then thought about expanding it to Philippines? So VR is great for like taking them in. So first of all, just motivate. They like, they feel the people, they feel the, the problem with the kids but also they start to pick up all the context you actually need to come up with credible advice. I agree that the ability through different scenarios to see things from different angles is amazing. Negotiation, mm. uh, you know, we have in the, in the law school and you, know, you can see the crime scene from the point of view of different stakeholders, amazing. Like, think how many things you can do, it's... it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I say, I mean, again, I think we're, still at the beginning of figuring out that it's exploration of it. it's uh, it's really but the excitement is you know getting those teams together how do you get the faculty with the the the, the technologists and the film people awesome so there was a, com a question that came in i thought it's quite interesting to what extent does ai help in accelerating development or hinder in accelerating redundancy thinking about it from a VR perspective. Um, so how do we leverage AI and VR? So one of the things that we have right now is when we have these conversations, either they have to be backed by an actor on the other side um, who's talking and dialoguing with someone in, as an avatar, or we have to give them choices. So A, B, C, or D, and we have a, a finite number of choices that we can give them. With generative AI, we can essentially have a seemingly unlimited world where people can interact using voice, they can receive dialogue, and it'll be more more like a real negotiation, more like a real difficult conversation. And I think those are some of the things that generative AI will really help us in the as we integrate generative AI with VR. One thing, it's not exactly the question, but I think we need to understand that the, uh, is that we are talking about, you know, we call AI VR, like it's the same thing, and we have so many things there. Like VR can be animated or not, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. and then AR is different from VR. And we heard a very interesting uh, lecture here today saying, yeah, like uh, AR can actually, augmented reality can be used, you know, to, to actually reduce uh, complexity of environment and help guiding you. VR can help you get into experiences that you haven't uh, uh, explored. Uh, it's a tough one about AI. I think we, are still, we still need to think carefully how we can really make it a, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that we're understanding the AI at all. Right? Okay, so, so many questions there. Well, clearly, if I think of AI and metaverse as huge complementarity. So if you're in a digital world, you can animate all those things. Um, now, when I think about immersive learning, still a little bit problematic. So certainly from an INSEAD point of view, we're experimenting with avatars and stuff, but so far we're filming real people on location or real actors. Um, one of the questions for me is, and this gets us along the research side, is well, if people are in dealing with, you know, avatars and stuff, do they really take it this, this seriously? Right? There's research that would say people are even harsher in a digital world, and and and, and you have to watch yeah, some of those things. So, that's, so I, I, by the way, I, I do think on the faculty side there's something super interesting because although we focused on the teaching side, there is this whole research element as well, and you can do. So it's too great. First of all, you can do a bunch of new things in terms of research, and it's a great way to get some faculty on board. And there, the economics of using VR are much better because you know it's instead of doing experiments where you bring students or other people, and again and again and again, it takes time. You can simply change conditions in VR. You can use uh, the classroom as you know a setting for research. So actually, research can enhance the economies of uh, using VR. Absolutely. So I know that you uh, at table four or something like that earlier today shared the experience of teaching the entire class in metaverse. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about that. So when COVID happened and we closed our um, our campus, our in-person campus, uh, we shipped 30 headsets to my entire emerging technologies class. Um, so they're kind of self-selected already, people who are interested in this kind of technology. Um, but instead of us meeting on Zoom or Teams, uh, we met in the metaverse in 3d space and so everyone put on a headset for class we met for about 45 minutes to an hour um, where we had dialogue with each other and kind of lecture i could project to a to a 3d space screen um, but with some really interesting things that we saw and i'm sorry for those of you who are at the table to hear the story again but one of the things we saw is that space matters 
and some of the social norms that we saw uh, and you see in a real classroom, we also see in uh, this 3D space. So for example, when I'm in my regular classroom, I stand at the podium at the end of class, people line up to talk to me about their grade or a question about the lecture or whatever, most times it's the grade, um, but they'll line three or four deep. Um, we saw the exact same thing happen in 3D space. They literally would line up, which you don't see on Zoom. So that showed that they had those same social norms were coming across in this space. We also saw, um, if you think about a room like this, as a 3D space like this, in the back of the 3D room, um, a student had lost her internship, and there was a master student who comforted her in this semi-private conversation that happened before class. And I could kind of overhear, but not really. And that was kind of the way as the rest of this class is getting ready to start. This was really natural to the way the real classroom is. And so what we saw is a really interesting experiment uh, where I think we will see great value in people gathering who are remote in 3D space. I want to add something about which is related about the extent of using VR, you know, from a whole course. So what I've been hearing here today is more or less uh, out of several meetings, we have one or two VR sessions. I think our collaboration with INSEAD is interesting in the sense that we have been developing uh, Professor Jacob Goldenberg from our place and mm -hmm. uh, Professor Elaborate Spector from your, your place. And there is the, mm -hmm. what is the marketing professor? Uh, Ava. 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 Yeah. They join together, they have a whole course, course on creativity and innovation. So six meetings, like, or, or at least a, a large chunk. This is something very different. Like, it will be a much more complete VR experience. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe for those people who haven't had VR for teaching, one thing that's important to understand is you don't spend the whole course with the headset on. So, well, yeah. so we're really yeah. disrupting the paper case. So you might put it on, watch for five or 10 minutes, then you debate the whole class. You don't spend you don't, And then you go back and forth. So it really is disrupting the paper case. But still, if people have come to campus, they still might as well interact in person. And uh, there's actually there's so lots of open. discussion. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, uh, yes. the other thing is like, a huge frustration. Because again, if the sort of metaverse thing had really taken off post COVID, all of this VR is metaverse ready, right? So if people at their home had the goggles, were interacting, we were ready to go because now we had the content to do. But I, this is where I'm, you know, I, I'm not sure that's a, that's not a 2024 thing. I don't, well, we'll see what Apple does. But as you said, I, I, I don't think so. It's going to go massive commercial. But still, um, it, it, it is just, I, I still find when people come together um, to, to augment the paper case with this, it, it leads to a really rich experience. Well, um, since we started with the audience questions, why don't we continue with uh, any questions from the live audience? Live from Abu Dhabi. I had someone uh, once share with me this idea that I thought was amazing. I wanted your feedback on it. But he was uh, an MBA student actually at INSEAD, and then he moved on and, and started creating. And he, he was, we showed him one of the VR demos that we created. And he was like, you know what I'd love is if this was a lifelong learning thing. Mm. If all of us MBA students could take this VR headset yeah. and you could tell us every month, here's a, here's a new innovation, you know, here's a new thing that we're talking about, here's a new research project. And so they're just getting this lifelong learning yeah. through this headset. So, yeah, yeah. so I just, maybe I'll start on the inside, sorry, right? So for sure, like when we build out the software to run the headsets and look at that solution, um, it, the software doesn't just work in the classroom, it works wherever the devices are, so they're on the internet. So in principle, if thousands of our alumni had the right hardware at home, um, we could do that. And again, it would be, look at, you know, put your headset on, we would play it and then go on Zoom and, and have a lifelong learning education experience, have your breakout rooms in, in, in groups. So yes, in principle, we could do that. But again, it's still getting to the point. So actually, sending people a device for a session and having them send it back it that's a little bit heavy and certainly one of the things you learn is the world it turns out despite all the discussion about globalization is not ready to ship hardware back and forth over international boundaries very easily so um it's there it's one of those frustrating things because like that use case seems like it's right there but i, I it's hard to touch in fact I think the essence of that question, too, is that um, consumers, students, consumers, graduates are different than they were 10 years ago, and they have high expectations, and 
they've paid a lot of money for these MBAs and they want to see great value and continuing value. And so we talk about lifelong learning, and I think this is a really important thing for all of these different MBA schools to be able to provide and, and show long term value. And I think the next step is after we master this in the classroom, that next step could be a subscription model or alumni model that allows access to it. I think the first step is what you said, which is the first thing is to get enough critical mass of experiences that it's worth giving every student a headset and then go away. And, and this the hardware actually is surprisingly robust. We were worried about breakage and stuff, but it, the, the, the stuff lasts several years. There might be a point in time, if we're not there, where people will have, I believe, will have VR masks like we have uh, for iPhones. It, it, we cannot predict how long it will take, but once this happens, everything will become, you know, this idea, clearly lifelong learning or something that we all face as a huge challenge for business schools because it's there, it's clear. But using VR for that, uh, I agree that logistical problems are currently the bottleneck. So, uh, what was the most challenging barrier that your, your institutions had to overcome to adopt VR um, in MBA and effective ed? It's the critical mass of champions. So uh, you have very few champions that develop cases, and of, of course I'm familiar with them, I'm happy to, to teach them. Now I think uh, we need to convince enough others to adopt them. And it's not easy to adapt uh, professors to use a different technology, a new technology, to change the syllabus whatsoever to change a case, even to change a case, you know, for a professor from one paper written case to another, it, it, it's a biggie, uh, let alone going to VR. So still we need to spread the word and for that we need success. We need to have aha moments in class. We have to see uh, the teaching evaluations of those using VRs uh, uh, being high and then others wanting to imitate that. Uh, I, I, I still feel that uh, at least as a dean, I feel that I'm still in this push thing, like, would you like to try it? Would you like me to come and give one of your classes? You know, I will do it all my free time, just to see how it goes. We still, we still need it. And, and I can understand that because, you know, professors are very busy. They need to do research. And it, is, it is something that consumes a lot of energy and time. So I'll add is I think a limitation has been the friction in getting someone started for the first time is that how much effort it takes. And part of that may be that we chose to go with the Oculus Quest, which I think I regret today. Had I um, you know, been in a different different knowledge, now that I know what I know now, I would have gone with a different headset. Um, but ultimately, there is a significant amount of friction at the beginning of class that is frustrating for students. And once they get in, it's fine. But that has really been a hindrance for adoption by some of the professors who are like, I don't want to give up those 10 minutes to get everybody in the headset. Yeah, same thing. Uh, I have a very hypothetical question. Basically, the question is going to be the following, and then I'll, I'll try to explain it. The question is, why don't you make your own headset? Now, the underlying, <laughs> issue, the underlying issue is you can see the battle of the standards coming very fast. Um, now, you, you, you're proposing a software solution, but you are more or less vulnerable to the battle of the standards that's going to happen. Why don't you, as a consortium, because standards are in principle uh, determined collectively, why don't you determine what the standards will be? There's undoubtedly some startup somewhere <laughs> who's willing to make the headset that you need. So basically the question is, why don't you, why do you make yourself dependent on Tech when you can make your own. I don't have a billion dollars. I mean, and the billion is the small number. Like, I mean, I think you know that's it's just too cost prohibitive to get in the hardware world. So yeah. again, I, I would I would say we would do well to bulk up. So again, right now I think people sitting there in these hardware businesses don't see it don't see classroom education as a key use case. So again, if we bulked up, we had more volume, but also if we were more organized and could go meet with them, that would help. But I, I would think more about managing the big tech, the tech players, um, and especially some of the hungrier ones, um, as you bring up, that might be willing to talk. Yeah. Software is a lot easier to build than hardware. Um, if you think about what it takes to put something on a chip and the amount of, you know, the, the basic chip costs over $10 million before you make the first one. 
right? So yeah. you've got to sell a lot of headsets to make that work, and there's just too many things. Hey, oh, we have, do we have, we have another question? All right. I will volunteer to answer. Okay, please. So the question is, while XR technology is emerging rapidly and bringing many benefits, okay. some people argue that face-to-face -face interaction is still the best way to know a person and build the relationship. What, what's your view? So maybe this uh, uh, touches on the point that Peter uh, mentioned earlier. Clearly, this is correct. I think one nice thing about VR cases that, is that you can use them remotely, but you know the typical case today, you know, post-COVID is that we meet in class, we have part of the experience using the VR case, then we go to a lengthy discussion, then go to stage two, and then in the discussion there is lots of inter class interaction. It's built into class interaction, so I don't think we're jeopardizing that. So I absolutely agree. You might disagree and say that one day we might have better interaction in metaverse, but... Actually, I wouldn't. I still think, you know, in my lab, I wanted us to come back to the lab, right? I want us to come together. The best situation is when we put people of very diverse backgrounds with different skill sets together to solve a problem and getting in the same room is valuable. Second best to that is what I would think will be the future of 3D space and be able to do that. But I don't think it replaces what we do in person. Yeah. Um, again, I, I would say, yes, we're trying to teach people to behave and interrelate and doing that face-to-face -face is great, but is it really, optimal to 100% face-to-face. So if people are in a rich, tense room on, I do you know where your students looked? No, but if, if you do that in VR, the headset will stream off where people looked. You can do things like, oh, maybe in this one, the, you know, the, the genders have changed around. And you can confront people, did that affect your attention? And, and so there's a set of things um, that we can do in a more lab controlled like VR setting that then will help people improve their their face to face. Yeah, that's, that's a great point because actually using some of the cases that exist today, you can have the same group of people sitting in the same class, uh, having different scenarios that might know or might not know that they have been seeing. This really increases the depth of the interaction afterwards. You could have done it with a simple discussion in class. You needed to send them to VR to experience something else, and then suddenly to realize that they saw something else, and the, the, this aha moment will emerge of that, and this is clearly supporting the interaction. And this is, you know, a lot of technology is not rocket science. It's just like realizing, like you said, wow, I can subtly vary the conditions and they don't, because it's a private viewing space. Right? That doesn't strike you right away, but then you start thinking with your faculty, how can you use that? And you'd be surprised um, the kind of things they can cook up. Also on the private viewing space, when we're working with executives, if, they're, if an executive is in there with other team members, especially people on their team, they are very fearful to take a risk. They don't want to be embarrassed in front of their team, but in the headset, Nobody knows what their choice was, and so they might take that risk and make a different decision than they would in real life. We actually do see that in the data. Yeah, it's so. interesting. It's a nice one. I see another question from the audience. Let's wrap up. Oh, oh. Raymond. One of the things that, that people talk about, uh, you know, is the comparison between using the immersive VR and using just conventional video. And, and during the lunch discussion, um, one, of the, one of the points that was made was that when you're using the immersive VR, you, you're able to tune things out. You're tuning out the person's cell phone, you're tuning out the rest of the world. And so it, 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 it is a more immersive and an emotional experience than, than what, what you get. And I think that you'll see pushback in terms of, you know, people say, well, you know, why invest in this because you can do video and so forth. But, uh, but, but it, it, I'd be interested in your thoughts about, uh, you know, what is so compelling about the, the VR experience? So, well, anecdotes, partly what you raise is a empirical question, right? Is it, because again, at the end of the day, when we educate, we're trying to, you know, reprogram a little bit what, what's in your head. And certainly we have anecdotal evidence. So we teach many programs, executive programs, multi-module. And so faculty will say, yeah, I was six weeks later, I was coming back. What do you remember from module one? And there's a lot of talk about the VR experiences. Now, that's anecdotal, um, I, I think, but this is the kind of stuff one would want to research and just see, is the immersive element making it somehow more memorable and making some of the learning stick? But, uh, you touch upon the uh, video is passive. This is a big thing. Uh, 
and the, the, f the fact that you can condition via VR is, is a huge advantage. You can send people to different scenarios par in parallel, simultaneously, and then make them discuss. But that, that's very powerful. And sometimes, you know, you can even make, uh, you know, things that are, they don't even, you ask, ask different questions and then you ask them, hey, did you notice that was there this sexual harassment that they, nobody even noticed? Hey, that's, you know, go back to the was there. So you, you can, because when we look at the heat map, everybody looked away. <laughs> so what was going on? So yeah, we, we, I, yeah. They, this is a question we get a lot. We get a lot and I can't understand it. Uh, and it is it rests upon us to convince people, but I, I truly believe that VR has a huge advantage over video. Yeah, I go, and just then also iterate, you need to be using those advantages. So if you're not careful, you could yeah. build something, and at the end of the day, the answer would be, no, you could have done that with video. So uh, you want to watch that. And as a, as a professor, I would love to think that every single person was only focused on what I was trying to teach, and they're not looking at their email, they're not checking their text messages. But, exactly, thank you. But in VR, for those five to seven minutes that we have them in that space, they are totally immersed and all everything is blocked out. And we at least get that kind of value. So I think that is a place where VR is really strong and helpful. And they, at least for five to seven minutes of that class, we have their total attention. There you go, Vic. Shall we wrap up? Well, thank you so much for joining us. Peter, Iran, and Stephen shared your uh, experience with us. And uh, look forward to other Tech Talk X's coming from Digital ASEAN. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.